Welcome to Wellesley's Convocation, the formal start of our academic year. I'm Alex Diesel, college marshal and professor of mathematics. <laughs> if you would please rise to join the Wellesley College Choir, directed by Lisa Graham, for the singing of the alma mater. The words may be found in the digital convocation program. Convocation. I'm college chaplain and campus rabbi, Dina Bodian, and it is my privilege to offer Wellesley College's land acknowledgement and today's invocation. We acknowledge that Wellesley College is built on ancestral and traditional land of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize that the United States removal, termination, and assimilation policies and practices resulted in the forced settlement of indigenous, indigenous lands and the attempted erasure of indigenous cultures and languages. We further acknowledge the oppression, injustices, and discrimination that indigenous people have endured and that there is much work to be done on the important journey to reconciliation. We commit to strengthen our understanding of the history and contemporary lives of indigenous peoples and to steward this land. We further recognize the many indigenous people living here today, including the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc nations, who have rich ancestral histories in Wellesley and its surrounding communities. Today, their descendants remind us that they are still here where they maintain a vital and visible presence. We honor and respect the enduring relationship between these peoples and this land, as well as the strength of indigenous culture and knowledge, the continued existence of tribal sovereignty, and the principle of tribal self-determination. I invite you to take a moment to look around. Notice all the faces around you, the beauty of the campus which surrounds us and embraces us here. Let us be fully present for one another here in this space. Let us take a moment to center ourselves as a community through gratitude and kindness. I offer this invocation in this spirit and intention. In gratitude for the one without whom we would not be here at all, we offer thanks. We are thankful for the family, friends, teachers and mentors, without whose support we would not be here today. Especially, we are thankful for those who are the first in their families to attend college. In our gratitude, may we pledge to serve and support one another in our learning endeavors and recognize that we all have much to learn from one another. We are grateful for the opportunity we have been granted for an outstanding education. In our gratitude, may we commit to and ensure that neither petty competition nor our own insecurities cause us to squander this precious gift. 
We are thankful for the people who make this institution a vibrant community, its faculty, staff, and students, and all those whose mission is to ensure our growth and learning. In our gratitude, may we pledge to treat one another with the respect, honor, and dignity we all deserve. Amen. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Wesley College President Paula Johnson. Thank you, Rabbi Bodian, for those beautiful and very meaningful words. And thank you to today's musicians, Yanvalu, under Kira Washington's direction. And thank you to Lisa Graham and the choir for your, as always, beautiful rendition of the, our alma mater. And I just want to advance, in advance, thank Lucas Kelly, class of 24, who lead America the Beautiful. So good afternoon. And welcome to the start of Wellesley's 149th year. Welcome to our new faculty, to our new administrative and union members, and to those of you who are returning. A big welcome back to our sophomores, juniors, and seniors. <laughs> you are out in mass. It's great to see you. The keepers of our traditions, both grand and sweet, and your role here could not be more important. And I want to give a special thank you to our senior class who persevered as a class to be admitted and experienced their first year during a global pandemic. And it's so wonderful to be here together today under normal conditions. And of course, a special heartfelt welcome to the incoming yellow class of 2027. The sunshine is out here in the back. And um, to our five new Davis scholars, to our 11 new transfer students, we are so thrilled to have you with us. <laughs> to our first year class, each of you brings enormous academic and personal strengths to Wellesley. Together, you are rich in what Wellesley's second president, Alice Freeman Palmer, called the wealth that lies in differences. You come from 43 states, plus the District of Columbia and Guam, as well as 26 countries outside of the US. Over half of you speak a language other than English at home. 24% of you are first-generation college students, and 58% are domestic students of color, identifying as African American, Asian American, Latinx, Native American, or multiracial. This means that you, our first year students, as is the case with all of our students, should expect to encounter people at Wellesley whose lives and perspectives are very different from your own, and they will help to expand your view of the world. Wellesley has always been a place for revelations. Since our founding, we believe that one of the most crucial aspects of a liberal arts education is encountering people who are unlike oneself. Last year, Wellesley joined forces with 32 other highly selective colleges to write an amicus brief in the Supreme Court case considering whether race could continue to be used as one of the factors among many in college admissions. Together, we asserted that in a society in which race still mattered, our experience has shown the educational benefits of a diverse student body and the societal benefits of educating diverse future leaders. In fact, there is an important body of research that confirms that diverse educational environments improve learning, critical thinking, problem solving, and leadership skills. We become larger as individuals because of the diversity of the community. This is a kind of social mutualism that echoes the biological mutualism in the landscape around us. Even the most impressive of the ancient trees on this beautiful campus did not attain its stature alone. 
It trades the sugars it produces through photosynthesis with networks of fungi at its roots, which brings other nutrients within reach. It's estimated that a single teaspoonful of soil beneath its canopy contains tens of thousands of different types of microbes, some of which it mobilizes to survive stress and fight off disease. The tree thrives through complex associations. So do we. As all of you know, at the end of June, the United States Supreme Court took away our ability to consider race in admissions, an important tool that Wellesley and other highly selective colleges have long used to ensure diversity in our classes. As an institution, of course we'll comply with the court's decision while remaining completely committed to ensuring the diversity of our students through a need-blind admissions process, by recruiting students from all backgrounds, and by continuing to consider for admission to well, their admission to Wellesley because of their individual strengths and what they will add to the class more collectively. Of course, the value in diversity is not representation alone. It's not enough to simply travel through a college career alongside peers with different histories, backgrounds, and identities. What matters is listening to those peers, developing curiosity about them, fostering appreciation, and sometimes closeness and friendship. We strive not just for diversity at Wellesley, but for inclusive excellence, which is the recognition that there really is no excellence without diversity and inclusion. Whether the subject is law, medicine, the sciences, humanities, or the arts, we need the perspectives of people from different backgrounds and with different life experiences to make progress in any field. The same is true for our development as human beings. And it is in this realm of engagement where Wellesley truly shines. To our new students, we take an unusual curricular approach to our life outside of the classroom as well as inside of it. Our residential life curriculum is designed to spur each of you to grow in important ways. We want you to become your own most authentic selves here while coming to appreciate the equally distinctive individuals around you and acquiring a sense of belonging among them. Developing a keen sense of yourself and a profound regard for others is the best possible training for success in your chosen profession and for happiness in your personal lives. It's also simply essential as you step into your roles as college students inside and outside of the classroom and as citizens in a pluralistic society and a democracy under threat. Research by political science Scientists Ronald Inglehart and Charles Wellesel found that around the globe, the strongest predictor of whether a country is an effective democracy is not the percentage of citizens who say nice things about democracy as a form of government. A far stronger predictor is the prevalence within a society of what these researchers label as self-expression values. These values include feeling that it's important to be true to oneself, supporting gender equity, being tolerant of all kinds of outgroups, expecting to participate in decision making, and generally trusting one's fellow citizens. In other words, individual self-respect plus an equal respect for others as individuals seems to be fundamental to free societies. In 1983, one of the most celebrated artists ever to graduate from Wellesley Lorraine O'Grady, class of 1955, illuminated this reciprocity of respect with a performance piece at the Harlem African American Day Parade entitled, Art Is. She created a float with an enormous gold picture frame and then sent her helpers out into the crowd with similar gold frames, which they held up to people to create instant portraits. The point, of course, was that black people are worthy subjects for art. 
But the photographs of that day also captured the individual parade goers' amusement and delight in considering themselves worthy of framing. In 2020, when the Biden campaign wanted to communicate President Biden's own sense of what it means to lead an inclusive democracy, it borrowed an idea from Lorraine O'Grady. The day the election was called for Biden, his campaign released a two-minute video that within a few days was viewed nearly 40 million times on Twitter. The video captured the breathtaking diversity of America's people, everyone from healthcare workers to surfers to oyster fishermen to school children all across the country as they proudly held up gold frames to themselves and each other. The message, equality and freedom mean that we are allowed to be gloriously different from each other. And this is the beauty of the United States. I'm so happy, by the way, that Lorraine O'Grady will be coming to campus in February, and then you'll have an opportunity to meet her. Yes, yes, <laughs> she is amazing. She is a force to reckon with. Um, and her exhibit will be at the Davis, just incredible. So yes, thoughtful voting is essential to democracy, but we need to do much more than to sustain an inclusive democracy. Countries around the globe have taught us that autocrats can win free and fair elections. They often borrow the forms of democracy while furtively undermining the spirit of democracy. A democracy that actually empowers the whole of society, on the other hand, requires participation by a wide array of citizens. But today in the United States, increasing political polarization discourages many people from participating in our civic life. We have trouble communicating across political divides and across many other fault lines in our society. It's hard work together to improve the country's laws and institutions if we can't talk to each other civilly or hear each other with a will to understand or feel free to express our own views. Even on this beautiful campus, I have heard that our students are sometimes afraid to reach out across differences. They avoid asking questions of each other out of fear that they'll say something clumsy or that the subject of their questions will resent being put in the role of cultural explainer. But how else can we learn from each other and come to fully appreciate each other as individuals and partners in this society? So I urge you to ask the questions, simple as, what are you cooking? Where do you come from? Tell me your history. What are you thinking about on a given topic and why? Wellesley professors Tracy Gleason and Octavio Gonzalez wrote something very wisely recently as they considered how to encourage civil discourse in Wellesley's classrooms. A large part of the process, they said, is getting to know the person behind the position and the set of experiences and assumptions that have shaped their perspective. To our students, try to get to know the person before addressing their position, even if the position may seem wrong or incongruent with your own on the surface. There may be more substance there than you anticipated. In an autocracy, nothing is more intolerable than dissent or any kind of break from the conventional line. In a healthy democracy, we need to tolerate and learn from a variety of, of views, not just in our own political sphere, but in our communities and in our lives. Free speech is a prerequisite for the inclusive excellence that we strive for on campus, as well as the foundation of democratic participation. And at Wellesley, we've always taught our students this, and many of you have heard this message from me in the past but we're teaching it with a new urgency and as an ongoing commitment now that we've joined the campus call for free expression alongside other colleges and universities intent on restoring the fabric of American democracy. This summer, 
Professors Gleason and Gonzalez and their peers from other colleges and, in, and universities came together for a civil discourse workshop. In residential life, the House presidents and residents' assistants prepared for your arrival by practicing constructive dialogue and by considering the kind of intellectual and cultural humility that helps us bridge differences. In other words, thinking hard about ways to create our residence halls as places that'll encourage you to stretch and grow. And yes, relax and have fun while you're at it. And just before Labor Day, more than 30 rising Wellesley sophomores gathered on campus to take part in a pilot civic action lab an immersive three-day experience to help them learn to talk across differences, to meet change makers, and to consider what active citizenship entails. In the next few years, we hope to be able to offer this program to all Wellesley sophomores. This coming spring, we plan to convene a major summit here at Wellesley focused on strengthening our democracy, featuring former U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, class of 1969, and other women who are at the forefront of this issue in the US and globally. Secretary Clinton wrote, if we can break out of our toxic us versus them dichotomies, if we can shrink our notion of the other and expand the we in we the people, perhaps we can discover that we have more in common than we think. I hope that as our students develop confidence in themselves at Wellesley, they develop equal confidence in their peers, learning to trust them and to assume goodwill, even in disagreement. Inside and outside of the classroom, remember to be grateful that you were immersed in different, sometimes contradictory, sometimes astonishing perspectives. Have the courage to explore them with your allies and friends and with allies and friends in the making. They will challenge you to develop ideas that are more considered than the ideas you hold today. They'll force you to find that common ground among differences that allows our democracy to work. They will demand tolerance, respect, compromise, and creativity from you and help you grow as students, citizens, and human beings. They will encourage your roots to reach outward and your limbs to spread into the sky overhead. They will make you absolutely magnificent. So I wish everyone a joy-filled academic year, and I thank you. So I'd now like to welcome Provost Andy Shannon. Thank you, President Johnson, and good afternoon, everyone. Greetings to all my friends and colleagues in the faculty and administration. I'm always grateful to you for showing up today, but especially when it's so warm, I particularly appreciate it. Uh, greetings and thanks to Lisa Graham and the Wellesley College Choir. Um, every year, you make the alma mater, which personally I find a challenging song, uh, you make it so resonant and uplifting. Thank you. And greetings and thanks to Jan Volu and Kira Washington. Every year, every year you generate such joyous energy at this event. Thank you. I'm delighted to add my welcome to all of you in the new yellow class of 2027. A warm welcome back to the classes of 2026 and 25, and hail to the red class of 2024. <laughs> Resplendent in the academic regalia you will be wearing at your commencement next spring. I'm mindful, as the president alluded to, that most of you seniors in the red class entered Wellesley in the first fall of the pandemic. And I'd like to begin by reflecting on that fact for a few minutes. 
Since the provost job is largely admin and doesn't involve teaching, I often feel at convocation as though I'm meeting the seniors for the first time. This year is a little different, however. This year I can say that I have met in person with approximately one quarter of you. We met in October of your first year, October 25th to be precise. You may have forgotten the occasion, and in some ways I rather hope you have. <laughs> because that Sunday afternoon in the fall of your first year, I was standing in front of Shakespeare House, dressed in fake 18th century clothing, wearing a tricorn hat. My name back then was Paul Revere. At that point in the pandemic, safety protocols prohibited travel into Boston, but a group of intrepid students had the idea of recreating Boston on our campus. They organized something called Moxton. <laughs> Mock Boston. The head of the Charles, for example, was relocated to the boathouse just behind me. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts was relocated to the Davis Museum. There was apparently a mock MIT frat party <laughs> in the Munger courtyard. And Shakes was Paul Revere's house. That's where a house president and I read the famous poem about the midnight ride. And at the end, I warned, the British are coming, the British are coming. <laughs> That afternoon, you traveled in small groups in your pods from one station to the next, nine stations in all. It was cold. You showed polite interest. <laughs> but you must have been thinking how strange it really was. Well, how strange was that entire semester? Sorry, term one and term two. Strange for all of us, and I can never say enough, also arduous and exhausting for all of us. Looking back on it, doesn't the thought that we were cut off from Boston seem positively surreal? The students in Dean Horton's advisory committee who dreamed up Moxton embraced the absurdity of their situation, and they were doing something about it, helping to build your community and helping you take possession of your campus. I realize that not all of you in the red class were here on campus that afternoon. Many of you were studying remotely, and many of the faculty and administration were working remotely too. But on Zoom or on campus, we were all improvising in an extraordinary way. It wasn't our, quote, normal academic community, but it was completely recognizable as Wellesley a kind of distillation of who we are and how we learn and teach together. We have always operated on the basis of mutual trust and the interdependence of teachers and learners. Those bedrock values expressed in the honor code were never more front and center than in 2020, when the masking and the testing and all the COVID protocols underscored our complete interdependence. We had assumed direct and literal responsibility for one another's well-being. Our classrooms have always been communities of learners, but never more so than during the pandemic. Facing the unprecedented challenges of social distancing and Zoom learning, instructors instinctively recognized the necessity of establishing community in the classroom as the precondition for learning. During that semester, faculty colleagues sometimes sent me emails that I thought of as dispatches from the COVID front. I'd like to read excerpts of one from a faculty member in the English department. She wrote, and as I read this, 15 of you here in this group are going to think, this is familiar. I've been teaching for over 20 years, but I was never more nervous walking into a classroom than I was on September 1st 2020. The masks, 
the desks five, uh, six feet apart, the Purell everywhere. There is an actual line on the floor of the classroom indicating how close I should get to the first row of students. And then at 10 a.m., there we all were, 15 masked students and one masked me. Could they hear me without a microphone? Yes, perfectly. Even with masks on, they looked entirely familiar. 15 first-year students in a room with new notebooks, funky pens, and fresh energy. By the second class, as I approached the room, I could already hear them talking to each other, really talking. No one was looking at the phone, and their conversation wasn't about COVID or restrictions or testing. They already call each other by name, build on each other's contributions to class discussion, allow themselves to make mistakes, and rethink ideas. That's extraordinary. Inevitably, those conversations and explorations in our classrooms, studios, libraries, labs, became a kind of refuge from the weirdness of the pandemic. They were an escape and a solace, a consistent theme that I heard from many faculty and students that semester was how the content of academic work grounded them, grounded you, in worlds that were in some sense beyond the reach of pandemic, and how thankful they were for that. For sure, there was some ambivalence in those feelings. Thinking of our academic work as an escape conjures up the image of the ivory tower. It's an old image originating in the biblical Song of Solomon with an almost equally long history of being criticized. Now more than ever, the idea that members of a scholarly community could or should disengage from the world in order to think or contemplate is highly suspect. It tends to be characterized as privileged self-indulgence, as deafness to the moral and political imperatives of addressing problems in the world beyond the bubble, or as wasteful obliviousness to the practicalities of life and to the needs and interests of the market. For the record, I don't believe we wanted to be an ivory tower in 2020. To the contrary, we were intensely aware of all that was broken or dysfunctional in our society, in our polarized and divisive politics, and in our stressed and overheated planet. We were well aware that the only path out of pandemic lay through the application of scientific knowledge and reason. So if there was ever a moment when the Academy's responsibility to society was acknowledged and embraced, it was then, in that season when the Red Class came to Wellesley. We were isolated by circumstances, not by preference. Moxton wasn't our preference. We had no choice. But it was also a moment when we experienced, together, the intrinsic value, the intrinsic satisfaction of academic inquiry, exploration, and conversation. In immersing ourselves in academic questions, we weren't turning our backs on the world. We were doing exactly what liberal arts education calls us all to do. We were searching for truth. Let me read a couple more lines from the English professor's email to remind us how exhilarating that truth-seeking felt. And if you weren't sure if you were in that class from the first quote, I think you will be from this. I started a conversation about documentary film, about the word documentary, by going around the room so that we could hear everyone's voice. Each of the students had very substantial ideas about documentary. And so I thought I'd take it one step further. I showed a clip from the classic 1975 film, Grey Gardens. Then, the floodgates opened. So many responses. I planned to end at 11.15, but then it was 11.30, 11.40, and hands were still going up. As I read that wonderful account of an experience that 15 of you had three years ago, I think about the case that the president has just made to us, the case that we need to become better at hearing each other respectfully and feeling free and able to express our own views, and that the classroom is critical 
to building our capacity to do just that. But why is that? What is it about the classroom that can develop our capacity for free speech and civil discourse? I'm sure there are many answers to that question. My answer is twofold. First, when we take an academic course, by definition, we are entering a world that is at the outset somewhat unfamiliar to us. Its language may be unfamiliar, its rules or organizing principles may be unfamiliar, its methods may be unfamiliar, and of course, its content is always more or less unfamiliar. Otherwise, we shouldn't be taking the class. That element of the unknown puts us, in some sense, on an equal footing in the classroom. We all have something to learn. For all of us, the unfamiliarity activates our curiosity and challenges our intellect. And the fact that we all have something to learn and something to contribute creates the ideal conditions for respectful listening and free expression. At the same time, I would argue that in one important respect, the classroom is different or should be different from our polarized polity with its alternative facts. In the classroom, when two people hold different views, I know it can feel like a direct confrontation, you versus me. But in a deeper sense, it's not, because the conversation in the classroom isn't ever just a two-way conversation. It's always at least a three-way conversation, you, me, and the truth. Of course, not a single monolithic truth or an unchanging truth, but the search for truth is at play in every dialogue and every experiment and every assignment. We shouldn't always expect to converge on it, but we should all be guided by the premise that there is a truth to be discovered on the basis of the evidence and of critical reasoning. That's the habit that a Wellesley education has always inculcated and must continue to inculcate. And that is essential for engaged and pro-social citizenship. So as we start this year, I hope you all have many experiences like that class's experience in September 2020. I don't think we want to make a tradition of Moxton. Although, I don't think we want to make a tradition of Moxton. We certainly never want to repeat the isolation and deprivation of the pandemic. But to lose track of time while engaged in a truth-seeking conversation, to feel the elation of freely expressing your thoughts and the productive jolt of being respectfully challenged, that can't happen often enough. Welcome again to this academic year. I will conclude in the spirit of truth-telling by noting that Paul Revere almost certainly did not shout, the British are coming. <laughs> Thank you, and now it is my honor to introduce the president of college government, Ingrid Bell. Thank you, Provost Shannon. Good afternoon, everyone, and another welcome to Convocation and to the 2023-2024 school year. My name is Ingrid Bell, and I am deeply honored to be serving as this year's college government president. I would like to begin by acknowledging that our gorgeous campus sits on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded lands of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag nations, and to recognize the continuing presence of indigenous people on this land and, the continuing con and their continuing contributions to institutions like this college. Wellesley as an institution and all of us as individuals must take steps beyond this acknowledgement and work to dismantle the colonial structures we participate in. Next, a massive congratulations to my fellow members of the red hot class of 2024. <laughs> Our path to get here has certainly not been easy, but the group of people that we have become is one that I'm so proud to be a part of. Our unconventional beginnings have led this class to carve its own path through this institution, to fight to hold on to the best of Wellesley and to change what wasn't working. 
So let's celebrate the overwhelming accomplishment of making it this far, and let's make this year our most fun yet. We've earned it. But, <laughs> but also, let's take full advantage of this chance to change our own and our SIBs experiences for the better. We often hear about the Wellesley community and what a wonderful thing it is to be a part of. And it is, it absolutely is. But it is so common that we talk about the community as a stagnant thing, something that is always here and that we simply step into the safe embrace of. Something that is somehow defined by our physical campus or by the addendum of wellesley.edu to your email address. Yet that could not be farther from the truth. The Wellesley community is an ongoing collaborative project. It is built and maintained by every act of love and care from one sib to another. So the love shown to me by a senior RA when I was in the darkest days of my freshman year is the same love I gave to a first year friend of mine who was struggling last spring and she will share that same love with a younger sib she has the chance to mentor. My RA from first year will never know all of the people her generosity and kindness will touch, but her legacy will be felt by generations of Wellesley students in the future. To the current freshmen, this class of seniors will be the deepest source of institutional memory they personally reach. But each time one of us offers up Wellesley lore or advice, we're drawing on three classes before us and they were drawing on three before them and so on creating a community that spans not just the four years of students here now, but years or decades of students in our past and our future. Our lives here have been shaped by the folks who kept our traditions alive and didn't let the upheaval of the pandemic years crush valuable parts of Wellesley, pushing to reopen the co-ops, keep our orgs running, and have fun while still being safe. We were and are supported and cared for by the SIBs who organized just last spring to support our trans students, and by the ones whose ongoing efforts brought us free laundry. Each, <laughs> Each change, however big or small, is a labor of love, and it is an honor to protect our SIBs work and keep building upon it. And it is not only the large organizing efforts, but the routine, everyday acts of kindness that let us build our best selves as well as the best institution we can. At its best, Wellesley is a place where your community picks you up when you fall down, where we learn from each other's mistakes as well as our own and do our best to give each other the freedom to fail, the safety net we need to grow. The threads of that safety net are woven by our official student leaders from RAs and HPs to ASCs and TAs to peer health educators to org eboards and team captains, but also by informal leaders the senior in your class who tells you it's okay to credit non, the neighbor whose pride flag on their door lets you know you do belong here, or the complete stranger who lends you a sled on Sev Hill when it snows. The threads of our safety net are woven by the friends who grab you an extra cookie from the dining hall on a hard day or cheer extra loud at your performance, and perhaps most importantly by sibs you will never meet who simply make the effort to leave our community a little better than they found it. When we assume the best of each other, turn toward our sibs instead of away from them, listen to the issues that are most important to each other and take action to support each other's needs, we make this place better not only for the students who are here now, but for students years and years down the line. We send the love of a hug on a hard day or the laughter of a plunge into the lake forward to future generations. We actively create and maintain the community we rely on and we ensure that each new class will have a strong foundation from which to make their mark on Wellesley and the world. So here's to the start of another incredible year with all of you. Here's to dancing at headphone disco and walking around the lake and cheering on our teams and excelling in our classes. And here's to building the Wellesley we will be proud to call alma mater. To continuing to fight for the acceptance and support of all of our SIBs. <laughs> There's no one I'd rather spend my last year of college with. And now I have the honor of introducing our phenomenal Chief Justice, Danya Srikanth. Good afternoon, students, faculty, staff, and administrators of Wellesley College. My name is Danya Srikanth, and I'm honored to be speaking to you here today as your Chief Justice. I'd like to start by sharing my favorite quote about truth from someone who spent his entire life 
searching for and writing about the concept. Before he wrote classics like War and Peace and Anna Karenina, Leo Tolstoy was a military officer in the Crimean War. In a time where censorship dictated which narratives could and could not be distributed to the public, he wrote an unvarnished account of his experiences, the senseless violence and disease that actually characterized the war. Tolstoy's series of short stories called the Sevastopol Sketches found the truth behind propaganda and informed the public about the war. At the end of one of his most visceral sketches, he writes the following. The hero of my tale, whom I love with all the power of my soul, whom I have tried to portray in all his beauty, who has been, is, and will be beautiful, is truth. For Tolstoy, truth was not just important for its own sake. It was also the first step to finding any kind of individual purpose. Honesty referred not only to a lack of dishonesty, but also to an active process of discovering the underlying foundations of daily life. In a much less dramatic, but equally fundamental way, this is also the story of college. Over our four years here at Wellesley, we try to learn who we are and who we would like to be. We find which issues we care most about and discover how we can best participate in the work we find fulfilling. It's important to acknowledge that these four years are a privilege. Not enough people in the world get to feel the exhilaration of a lecture that feels like it unlocks a new part of our brain, or to learn and produce meaningful work at the same time. I know that each day here I feel incredibly lucky to receive an education that allows us to think about concepts like truth and meaning to find fulfill fulfillment and not just sustenance. Of course, that doesn't change the fact that this journey has been and will continue to sometimes be difficult. We may find ourselves at dead ends, feeling incredibly lost and alone. And while it's true that we will have to find our own answers, we don't have to go through the labyrinth alone. More than a century ago, students at this college decided that the only reason, decided that respect would be one of our guiding principles. Of course, I don't believe that the only reason we are honest or respectful is because of the honor code, but it is important to acknowledge that when we decided that students would lead our own governance and hold ourselves to a higher standard, we also committed ourselves to helping each other in our search for answers. So on this first day of classes, I want you to think of the honor code as two promises. The first to yourself. Continue searching for your answers and asking questions that get you closer to those fundamental truths. And the second, realize that while the pursuit of truth may be inherently individual, the extension of respect is what makes us a community. And now, I hope you'll join me in the ceremonial recitation of the honor code, which you can find in your digital programs. It says, as a Wellesley College student, I will act with honesty, integrity, and respect. In making this commitment, I'm accountable to the community and dedicate myself to a life of honor. Now, please stand for America the Beautiful, penned by Wellesley's own Catherine Lee Bates. This will be followed by the benediction. Lucas O'Kelly, class of 2024, will lead us in singing America the Beautiful.
purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God has shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with siblinghood from sea to shining sea. That was beautiful, Lucas. Thank you. Dear friends, a blessing for the coming year. May we be humble in our learning both in and outside of the classroom. May integrity and openness to being wrong be a hallmark of our learning. May we be graced with friends, teachers, and guides throughout our time here. And may we remember to be thankful for them. May we offer a kind smile and grant grace to everyone we encounter, knowing that they too are complex, have challenges, have a backstory. And may we be kind both to others and to ourselves as we embark on the adventure of a new academic year together. Go in peace and joy into this new year. Thank you, Rabbi Bodian. My name is Katherine McIntosh. I'm from the yellow class of 2003, and I'm the, <laughs> the executive director of the Alumni Association. I would like to invite all of you, to, if, including faculty and staff, to stay for one of our most beloved traditions, step singing following convocation. Um, faculty and staff, please, after the recessional, gather in the back, and students, please keep your seats, and we will be starting step singing, singing quite shortly. Thank you. If you are not staying for step singing, this concludes our convocation ceremony. Please, faculty, please follow the convocation marshals and let us begin the recession. Thank you. <laughs>